the session. I am, okay, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Luca Morlotti, I'm from the company Fitchet, Italian company. Later on, I will have a speech here. And uh, my co presenter my is. Is Johnny Yama from the Yamaha Center. Okay, so we can start with the first section uh, from Mr. Luis Francisco Scudelari de Macedo. Yes, right? sir. Very good. It's about the buckling check of structure being lifted. Yes. Uh -huh. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for listening. Uh, I, this is a presentation for a structure engineer, so I hope I don't disappoint the, uh, most people in the audience. And uh, yeah, it's supposed to bring a little bit of the practice that we implemented for these checks of uh, structures being lifted. So talking about a bit uh, of my company, we are Emaz Engineering. Me along with my brother and associate, we are based in the Netherlands, and we also have an office uh, based in Brazil. We are consultants for uh, structural steel and structural engineering in general. But lately, we've been having a focus more into constructability, modularization, and direction engineering uh, analysis. We use uh, ANSYS as our tool for that, so that we can keep up with the state of art on uh, numeric analysis for our problems, because problems can get kind of quite uh, refined for uh, direction engineering problems. Uh, a bit about our experience, so we had experience in erection of not only steel structures but also mechanical equipment for all sorts of uh, projects from industrial projects, so power plants, uh, uh, petrochemical projects, and also wherever uh, complex structures are present we can act, like uh, the roofing of stadiums or canopies. And so talking a bit about the benefits for using uh, large modules, which is what's called for the booking analysis when looking. So the benefits are for sure, you, you can work on ground, so people work safer, it's better for flex in the places that they do work. They are more efficient on their work, they have a safer perception to perform their, what their activities. And also some, a lot of parallelism is possible because you don't have the overhead work, especially for uh, multi-story buildings. So you can make like an area where everything is being pre-assembled uh, for later the, the lift. That impacts of course the, the schedule, the parallelism impacts the schedule and costs. So uh, now getting a bit more specific into the, the problems. The challenge when performing the buckling analysis of an object being lifted is that uh, it's not well posed uh, statically because you only have one point of support and no lateral support. So it's a dynamic equilibrium situation as opposed to a static equilibrium where the lateral liftings are being balanced by the inertial forces of the part being lifted and by the small cable inclination, the pendulum action. So that can be analyzed that way, but it's more, much more consuming uh, time-wise and uh, the procedures must be much more carefully studied. So it's better to bring it to a static analysis. And that's the current practice and that's what we did for most of the analysis that we did. To another challenge for, for the lifting condition is that uh, the part being lifted is not braced as it would be on its final position, so it's in many cases, very susceptible to, to buckling. And if you have an irregular module being lifted, it might get very difficult and tricky to actually determine the K factors, your effective length factors for the buckling check. And also the notional loads, which are the traditional way of imposing imperfection on a structure, cannot be used here because our structure is very sensible to what happens laterally from being supported to from more than one position. So, to overcome that, uh, we have two alternatives that we've practiced uh, lately. We have the linearized buckling check and we have the non-linear buckling analysis, which we use the direct method from the AISC, the design guide for EPA. One is a simple direct linear analysis, uh, much more uh, safety factors include, more conservative, and uh, it's suited, it brings less conservative results for plate-like structures. And the other one, the direct method from AIC, is very suited for frame-like structures, like uh, when you're lifting a structural steel module, so that uh, you're not so, you're not having so much uh, conservativeness on your buckling analysis. 
Now, to set a static model for the buffering analysis, first thing we need to do is to make it well posed. So to do that, we need to add fictitious uh, lateral restraints. In this case, I'm making an example in two positions, the red marks. Uh, they can be in many positions on your model, like experience uh, uh, helps when determining that. And the idea is that you make an interactive process to add those fictitious uh, lateral support, load your structure, and then read the reactions that you have there, and you want to make that reaction as small as possible. That uh, one thing that can help is that you use uh, spring stiffness at those locations, and both the spring stiffness and the reaction that you're gonna read there must be somehow related to the forces and the stiffness of what is happening here, like of how people would be like pushing your module so that uh, you have like a physical relationship between what's happening in those fictitious points to react. Uh, and it's important to, to have those reactions very small and to have that, it's uh, <coughs> crucial that the center of gravity from your model, the theoretical center of gravity, is exactly as close as possible numerically that you can have from the point of uh, support from the crane. So that requires some calibration procedures. To do that calibration, what we usually do is we distribute some nodal forces, mainly in the locations where you have heavy connections on your structure, and then you make a calibration procedure on those nodal forces so that uh, you, from an optimization process, you translate your center of gravity from your model until it is numerically exactly under the, the hook position. And that uh, helps a lot in decreasing the reactions on your fictitious lateral supports. Then uh, the next step to perform the eigenvalue buffering analysis using the, your dead weight as imposed load. Then you're gonna capture your modes, your shapes, and your load factors. Uh, you're gonna use those shapes, those modes in further analysis. Both options will use them. And one important aspect here that we like to highlight because we see a lot it being done this way in practice is that the load factor you get from an eigenvalue analysis is not directly a measurement of how far away you are from buffering. That's not a safety uh, assumption. Because there are many uh, simplifications on your model, it does not take into account uh, imperfections or uh, uh, residual stresses. So the load factors must be treated before they are seen as how far away you are from buffering. Then, now talking about the first method, the ASC direct method. So we begin with an imperfect structure, which is in the case, in this case we're showing a mode shape, which we need to be scaled, because a mode shape is just a shape, uh, to reflect a uh, physical tolerance that we have. And usually for the tolerances, we go for reference such as the code of standard practice from the AISC. And then you have an imperfect structure. And you also need to include in your model a softening of the structure, which is made uh, by changing the modulus elasticity modules. And uh, it can, there, are, there can be some complications, but to simplify, if you scale your tolerance for 1.5, the values from the code of standard practice, then you can just uh, use 8% of your elasticity modules and then you're fine for, for the analysis. Uh, then the next step is you set all your buffering length factors k to one, which is super uh, convenient. And you, of course you need to have your model with your geometrical nonlinearities turned on. You must have uh, inner nodes included, so that the p delta uh, for the element for the elements for the numbers is in, is considered. And you amplify your loads with load factors that I'm going to show later. Then you run your analysis and you're gonna get results like this one, which are <coughs> uh, displacement load curves, and your global buckling capacity is obtained either if you hit a limit point where after you have unloading, or if your model stops to converge or reach this plateau as in this uh, configuration on the right. Uh, probably what's gonna happen is you're gonna reach a member capacity prior to reach your global capacity, so your capacity for buffering is going to be truncated somewhere between those two extremes. Then 
uh, talking about the linearized buckling analysis. So it's a different approach, a simpler approach, not a nonlinear method. So it start with, starts with the eigenvalue analysis. From the eigenvalue buckling analysis, you can obtain the location where your structure is most stressed from a moat, like in this case, uh, we have that of arrow pointing on the red region. From that location, we, we're now tracking that location, and then we change for a linear static analysis, not, not anymore the eigenvalue analysis. And then in this linear static analysis with the dead load, I'm gonna read the stress at that location I saw as a critical location for my eigenmode, <coughs> and I'm gonna capture my stresses there from my dead load. Then this stress that I captured there is a representative stress that I'm gonna scale with with my load factor to reach a critical stress, which now would be related to the Euler buckling uh, condition. With this critical stress and with my yield stress, I can derive a slenderness parameter, which shows me how far away my uh, buckling condition is from yielding. So if those two stre stresses are close, it means that my structure is compact because I have uh, them close to each other. If they are far away, my structure is slender. So then with my slenderness, I go to traditional buckling curves, which now will include imperfections and residual stresses, and each typology of structure will have a different buckling curve. And I will derive a reduction factor to be used on my <coughs> critical stress. And that's how I derive my buckling capacity. Then I must apply my load factors. My load factors can come from different standards. Mm -hmm. Usually we use either the ISO code or the DNB-GL uh, code. DNB is a Norwegian certification company. And then there are load factors for all sorts of uh, uh, uncertainties that you have related to a lifting operation. And they are applied one up to the other and calibrated so that you're not so over conservative or less under conservative the operation. Uh, we made then a comparison study for a lifting operation of a typical truss. So it's a truss that would weigh around 26 tons and we made then the eigenvalue analysis of that truss. <coughs> From the eigenvalue analysis and the load factor, we reach a linear buckling capacity where the critical stress was on that position mark with the arrow there of around 59 tons. And using the direct method code for the same truss, we reach a collapse uh, load of 82 ton. This 82 would be kind of uh, how much the truss would wait, could wait until it would reach collapse with that geometry. And, uh, but that's limited by the buckling of a local member, also in that blue arrow that we're pointing there, where that would be of 77 uh, tons. So, this shows that indeed the linear buckling analysis is a conservative method when compared uh, to the direct method for a frame-like uh, structure. And that's it. So the conclusions are that the liftings are not well posed problems for static analysis, but that can be overcome by some modeling strategies. We have two methods to check buckling in that condition, and that's the Linear buckling analysis, is, if applied for frame-like structures, will bring like over-conservative results. We prefer to go for the direct method from the ISC. That's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions?